Oh. Okay. <laughs> That's wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Lord, we're thankful to you for this opportunity. Lord, uh, even as we gather here over technology, I pray may our time be fruitful. May we be able to learn these tools in a good way that will help us to study your word in a better way. Be with me, Lord, even as I wrap up these four sessions that we had together. And uh, may these be truly a blessing to all of them, and God willing. You will give an opportunity for us to share with our friends too. When we see somebody's thirst to study your word. So we ask all of these things in your son's most precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's let me share my screen. So interesting, we've come to the final week, right? This is where. Okay. Any questions, any doubts till now? Any anything that uh, you would like to ask? Um, Krishna, was last week's Bible study recorded or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm going to do is uh, I, I, I will touch upon a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that should give us some clue on uh, what happened last week. So I, I don't think it would be, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I won't be able to cover the entire thing, what I saw, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but some briefly I will surely touch upon. Yeah. Okay. Now, first and foremost, like, I mean, if you see my subtitle, it is, uh, I intentionally titled it as pre-Bible study. Of course, my assumption goes uh, to say, like, I believe these things that have, we have been learning, if we learn it properly. So when we look at in our Bible, like, I mean, uh, next time, whenever we open, it should look new. It should uh, give us some freshness. So that's been my thought. I mean, of course, the key content if you see uh, if for some reason if you have an opportunity maybe down the line if you read this book called how to read the bible for all it's worth maybe many of the things that i have spoken you will see in that particular book it's a good book it's a very good book uh, however i felt like that is at an advanced stage but uh, in my over enthusiasm i mean let me tell you the story behind the, the uh, my desire or my liking for that book. My conversion story is like uh, I, I go to the college, a friend of mine uh, who was in the same dormitory along with me, I see a lot of radical change in him uh, when compared to me. Like, so as a college student, like I mean, I felt like, yeah, young people should have fun. I mean, what is this boy? Why is he, why is he different? So um, initially, I, I did not uh, really like, I thought maybe he's pretending, I mean, uh, so then I mean, I took some time, I took some time to sit with him and uh, ask him, like, uh, his name is Michael, so Michael, tell me what's the reason that I see so much of a change in you when compared to me or to many of the other friends that we have in the class. So Michael told me something very interesting and very funny at that time. He said, like, uh, um, Krishna, I was just like you, just uh, six months back, but uh, I happened to go to a meeting, I mean, my, by my church, some friends asked me to come. So I went there and then the speaker, he gave some good talk and, uh, Towards the end, he told me, like, if anybody would like to know more about God, uh, would you raise your hand? Uh, 
I will know and I'll pray for you. So then I said, like, okay, there's nothing wrong. So he raised his hand and the speaker took a note of that. He prayed for all of those who raised their hand. And uh, once the, towards the end of the meeting, they told one announcement saying, whoever has raised their hand, if we can stay back for a little while, we would like to give you some helps or tools to, to guide you. So Michael stayed back and then to his surprise, there were a few more young people who stayed back and then that was the beginning of his journey into this Bible study world. So they encouraged him to be a part of a small group who met week on week, picked up a Bible book of the Bible and then tried to uh, understand it. So he, he told me like, you won't believe just six months back, this all happened. And for the last six months, uh, I've been a part of this Bible study groups and uh, it helped me a lot. Probably as I was a part of this group that brought the change in my life. So I, I, I didn't take it really very serious. I thought like, okay, I have heard this story uh, of people uh, changing from completely a different lifestyle to a new lifestyle after becoming Christians. Uh, though in my family, like my mother comes from a Christian background, my father doesn't. So it was a mixed marriage. So it was like a, it was like a, a, a half and half. <laughs> so uh, I, I knew the uh, Christian side because I would hear some stories of like uh, how people's lives were changed. But then to interact with the young person, uh, like this was very uh, different to me. So it was good, but it was uh, quite a new thing for me. And then after a few months of a little restlessness within me, I, I, I one day I asked Michael, Michael, uh, why don't you help me? Like, why don't you tell me, how can I be like you? So he said, well, I'm glad that you asked that question. It's very simple. I will say a prayer, you repeat after me, and then I'll tell you what to do. So I said, okay, that sounds quite fine. So he said a few words. I mean, obviously the prayer, what they say, the prayer of compassion or the prayer to ask God to forgive our sins and then uh, give a new life. So I repeated word after word after him. And then he said, Amen. I said, Amen. And he said, now you have a new life. Don't worry. You will be one. You will be, uh, you are on a new path. I never thought like it would be so easy. I mean, uh, I almost all felt like, wow, this is so interesting and exciting. But then he, he was kind to give me one, one Bible, an entire Bible, NIV. The weakness at that point of a time for both of us was Michael was just six months new in his faith or though he was a part of the church, he never took seriously his faith. So six months of Bible study uh, fellowship or that meeting suddenly was stopped because both of us came to a completely a new place uh, to study. And then here we were. I'm a new Christian. He is six months older than me in faith. So now we, both of us are struggling trying to figure out how to grow in faith. But then we just have the Bible. And I just try to make sense out of it, like reading whatever I can. I basically would start with the, the Gospels and then, because he initially guided me saying like, start with the Gospels, it will help you. But the decision in the 1990s, uh, did not leave me uh, with peace. So there was this, always a desire to know something more about the Bible. So when I came back to the city after education, uh, had an opportunity to be a part of a Bible study group. And then I did some, uh, some certificate courses. So that journey continued for 10 years, almost 10 years. And of course, uh, Close to 10 years, I mean, I, I take a different path. I responded to God's call and took a, uh, a 
gave up my career, I would say, or I mean, moved from the banking side to the Bible College student. Ten years uh, that was in two thousand seven. In two thousand seven, I was introduced to this book called "How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth," and that was a very fascinating thing for me. Because 10 years I've been studying the Bible in these small study groups. Uh, we were just trying to make sense of whatever the best that we can. But this one book was so helpful. In my two and a half years of study there, I would have read that book a few times. So that was real great uh, uh, encouragement to me. And I always felt like, oh, this book is really going to... Uh, should be a kind of a prerequisite to uh, to the Bible, to the Bible as such, because I mean, some many times like people who walk into the church or who want to grow in faith might not have the opportunity to be systematically helped to grow in faith or to study and know what is God's word. So I really was excited. So in my excitement, I mean, when I returned back to India. Uh, I went to Singapore, from there to India Bank. I got this copy now at an Indian publisher, the same copy, but the publisher is Indian, so the price is Indian price. So I was so excited. I said, like, wow, this is a wonderful thing. At no cost I'm getting. There I paid in dollars. I mean, wow, so I should buy. So whenever I'll go to the Christian bookshop, I'll buy 10 copies of that because the thought is this is the book. And I started giving it as a gift to my friends, whomever uh, invited me for their birthday, marriage, anniversary, whatever. Like whenever I had an opportunity or if somebody said, come, let's have a coffee. So I'll just take it as a gift. So this was my silent way of encouraging them to study God's word. And then I'm excited. I'm happy. I mean, wow, somebody else has also found uh, this book. Then. But then one day something very interesting happened. I, I give a book as a gift to my friend. And my friend in a smiling way says, uh, Krishna, you have already given me this book. Oh, okay. So I don't even have a record of him. To whom am I giving this book? So, and then I ask him, so what do you think? Like, uh, how's been the book for you? Uh, he says, like, to be honest, I really didn't have so much of a time to study, to read into this book. So I just took it and put it in the shelf. Oh, that really made me a little surprised. But then it also prompted me to now ask the question, I have given this copy to several of my friends. So let me check, like, I mean, what have they done? Like, how has it been? So now in my silent conversations, I will ask them, like, I mean, in a gentle way, like, so how has that been book? So reply after reply, that was the same thing that I heard, that people didn't have time. They wished they could study, but they did not study. They just put it there. So now there is a greater desire within me and a confusion like, oh, here I felt like I have discovered a great book. But then I couldn't uh, inspire them to read that book. So that thought was there for a long, long time. Uh, so when, I mean, I had this opportunity to do something for St. Andrews and St. Stephen's, I thought like, let me see, I mean, if I can simplify it much more and put it in this form called pre-Bible study. Once again, I mean, it's obviously not everything of that book, but a few things. So one, the desire is like, probably these four hours of, study or session together will surely help in some way. So that's a long story behind my designing of this course. And I hope, I mean, it would be of some help. And down the line, uh, yeah, maybe I would surely wish that you would read that book. I'm sure it would be of some help. Because as much as we, we really want to understand God's word, uh, there are definitely going to be challenges because we don't realize that this is not one book. This is a, a small mini library of 66 books. 
And all of them are not in the same genre. Like, I mean, some have a different genre, some have a different way to understand, different uh, uh, way to interpret it. So, like, all of this are very essential. So let me quickly sum up or go through some of the things that I said till now, just for a quick uh, uh, refresh for your ourselves. So in the very first week that we said is Bible God's word, and then we all agreed saying like, yes, there is no doubt, it is God's word. But then the next, the follow-up question was like, so is Bible literature? And then we also agreed like, yes, Bible is literature. So when it is literature, it will also follow the rules and the laws of literature. So it cannot uh, uh, be completely removed from that world of literature, right? So we have to understand the literature as a literature. Now, what else did we look in? I did ask you yeah, if any thoughts. Uh, maybe I will pause here. Any questions, any thoughts? Okay, this part, we'll keep it towards the end. For now, let's quickly rush through a few more things. Then we looked at, in the literature, there is going to be alphabet, there is going to be grammar, right? So, as we all know, with al alphabet, I mean, when we were beginning in our childhood, we were introduced to a, B, C, D to Z, and then we were introduced to grammar, the nouns, the verbs, the proverbs, pronouns. <laughs> There's no proverbs, right? So all of that we were introduced. So, and then we followed, we learned English. Similarly, Greek too and Hebrew too does have. So these were some cards or some flash notes that we as students had to purchase and memorize. In fact, I thought, like, I mean, today I'll teach you a great deal about the language, but I felt oh, there's no point in scaring you uh, rather than the purpose would be defeated in, in like, uh, instead of helping you to get more interested in God's word, I think probably I will be putting in you the fear of uh, this new language because some of us might lack learning new languages, some of us might not. So, but then there are good tools. I will tell you one tool as we come ahead. So Bible also will have to follow the same, the written word, right? Okay. And then we looked at what is Bible? What is it? Does anybody want to recollect? It is just not about history, geography, but it is one key thing. And what is that one key thing? Anybody would like to uh, give it a try? The Bible, all the 66 books are revolving around one key word. Anybody want to give it a try? It's revolving around the word called theology, right? Okay, theology, that is the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God. Theology is nothing but knowledge of God. So when we are saying in a Christian field, so we are just saying it's talking to us about the God of the Bible, right? So theology, the knowledge of God, the God of the Bible. Because as I mentioned earlier, like there can be a theology of other faiths too. So they too can be seeking their knowledge of God. So here we are saying it's a knowledge of God's word in from a Christian perspective. What else did we look at? We felt like when we are trying to read and understand, we have to keep in mind context, context, and context. One of the simplest ways to understand context is to read something before and something after. So that really helps us to put things in context. Okay, so this was mentioned in this particular context. So yeah, context is very important. What else? I mean, if you recollect, I gave you this 
big picture wherein when you're studying, look at the words of the passage. Da, 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 da. Okay, so I mean, if not everything, but probably this one thing, you can keep it in mind. Okay. I will go. Nice to see you. Take your time. Have a coffee. Breathe, breathe a while. Take a deep breath. Probably have some water and then you're welcome to join us. Yeah. Okay. So context is important. And then, as we mentioned, like you will in the week two, we did also mention that there is a history as well as there's a geography. Because if you forget that, I mean, sometimes we will think like, ah, oh, this is like uh, the story of Aladdin and the something else. It's not those stories, or it's not uh, mythology. What they're saying, it's it's real things that have happened. That's what we believe. Right? I mean, some of them might say like, no, 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 that is uh, has done. So there are some things like, for example. Uh, within the literature, there can have been a, put some stories, like for example, parables. I mean, uh, we believe, like I mean, those are not those are told as a story to make us understand. But there are many real things too, right? Okay, so that's what we looked at earlier too. What did we see last week? Especially, I covered a lot on the social world. Social world is very important, especially because. Mm, just like, I mean, if you see the weather now, right? I think the summer has started, if I'm not wrong, though it has been raining a little bit here, the summer has started. So if you see the weather, let's imagine the weather in Canada, right? So now people are wearing maybe just one clothing uh, and they can just walk around because the weather is nice and warm. Then comes the rain. Then what will happen? The temperatures will not rise, but go down. As the temperatures are going down, then we are adding layers, right? So we don't want to feel cold. We just want to uh, be as comfortable as possible when we are walking. So we, will, we are putting on layers. So when we are studying God's word, we are dealing with the world of the first century if you are looking at the New Testament as such. And if you are looking at the Old Testament, we are looking at much more even before the first century. So to remove those layers is not an easy thing. Like, I mean, in fact, what I see is the way the scripture sometimes is interpreted in the advanced parts of the world to the advancing parts or still the, well, I mean, if I were to say uh, global south, the ways of interpreting are different or the layers that have been removed or need to be removed can be quite uh, not so easy. Like for example, I mean, uh, there's a word called historical Jesus. So there's been, a, there's been a big moment called the quest for the historical Jesus. So what it means is basically, who was this Jesus? How do we know him? So in order to know him, now that we are in the 21st century, how do we move from 21st century backwards to the 1st century or the 2nd century? So things have to be understood. So once we understand their social world, and then... We should also understand our own social world, right? Our society functions in a particular way. So what is our social world? Then comes the point of, I mean, trying to connect then and there to the here and now. So that's what we say, the final step, the application. But the application, we have to be much more careful. I mean, as I said, like uh, some things that were done in the first century, might not and are not done now. So at the same time, how do we discern which one to follow and which one to leave is not going to be easy. Like for example, let me give you a small example. 
um, like from the land that I come from, when I mean in a traditional setting, not in all, but in a very traditional setting, when an elder uh, enters a house, the younger people might touch their feet as a, as a mark of respect. But then for to somebody who's observing this from an advanced part of the world, they might think they are worshipping, but if they're not worshipping, I mean, it is something like just a mark of respect they might be doing. And like, for example, I mean, uh, last week I was talking about the parable of the prodigal son. So, for example, the, the when the prodigal son asked the father, like, I mean, I want the money uh, and I want to leave, he is, that is very disrespectful for him. Not to the son, but to the father, because it's a culture of honor and shame, wherein the son is shaming the father by asking him. It's almost like saying, I don't think you're going to die soon, so I just want to get my money and I want to use it when I'm healthy. So it's a very disrespectful way. So the social, their social world is very, very different to ours. So, but there are definitely, I mean, uh, uh, good ways that we can learn some things which we have to. So last week I was telling you about two good books. One is by Patricia Dachawals, who is currently the moderator. Uh, this book will help you to uh, understand uh, the Old Testament, the social world of the Old Testament. It's a very user-friendly or simple language written, unlike the heavy academic books of, and the second one is for the New Testament, the New Testament Christianity in the Roman world. Fortunately, though, both, both these people are from Vancouver. So just in case if you come across sometime, anytime, you should ask them, <laughs> how's been your book going on? Or I mean, I don't understand this page number, what you meant. <laughs> so, yeah, but these are very good books. These are very good books. So we are really fortunate to be uh, in this place wherein these wonderful authors also live. So what I was telling last week was understanding the social world or the first century world, like if we don't understand that poverty was rampant in the first century or uh, the killing of the girl child was very, very common I mean, in the first century. There have been letters found uh, wherein a Roman soldier is telling to his wife, like, I mean, if you think like uh, uh, it's not going to be a boy, I mean, do you think we, can we really take care of the girl? So those kind of uh, uh, conversations were, have been recorded and uh, have been have been shown to us. So poverty was rampant. Genocide of the female child was rampant. But then, even in this stage, in the power, in the in that kind of a setting, the Christian presence was, especially the first century Christians, wherein uh, they they were the ones who established the shelters or cared for the poor, especially when there was a plague, uh, when even the physicians were leaving. Uh, these new Christians were willing to even. I mean, some of them died uh, when caring because, I mean, as you know, a pandemic or epidemic can really uh, be very dangerous. So, Rodney Stark in his book uh, Rai, uh, says, like, Rai, the rise of Christianity is is not a Christian theologian. He's a sociologist, but he 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 writes very well. Like, what contributed to the rise of Christianity, at least in the beginning? So poverty. And these kind of things were real. And uh, the family structure was very patriarchal. That is, the father had the, uh, the say in everything most of the times. The father. Uh, so that's the very reason, like, to, dis to disrespect the father was seen as a matter of shame. So it's a culture of honor and shame. Honor and shame. So honor and shame. To whom are you giving honor? Mostly they are, first and foremost, they are giving honor to the patriarch. Then 
there is somebody called as a patron too. Like who is a patron? He is more like an, a person with wealth, a person with uh, resources, greater resources when compared to the 88%. I mean, last week I was showing you the statistics of 88% of people when they were poor and just uh, just subsistence or below subsistence. So the patron or these elite were only hardly 1% or 2%. But they uh, received honor. They received honor. How? Because they contributed also for the welfare of the society. Like, for example, they would build the roads or I mean, if the, there's a need for the city, they would contribute. So if somebody is charging something excessively, it is not very favorably looked upon. So it was a society wherein people, especially the poor ones, if they realize like, okay, these rich people are really uh, making too much out of all of this, they would not uh, give them the same kind of an honor or uh, they would not treat them with respect. So that was important. So in a world like this, for Paul to ask a patron, Onesimus, to treat his slave Philemon on an equal status is unheard of. It is, cannot be imagined. But then, I mean, again, the question is, how could Paul uh, command or expect or demand something like this from a very rich man who had a higher status in the society, whereas Paul, the tent maker, who just most of the time would survive on the generosity of uh, the people of the church, or maybe his tent making business would have helped him some way, but it is nowhere compared to the rich of the day. So the patron is honoring Paul because of Christ, because he too found Christ, because he too believed like Christ was the way, Christ was the one whom they did not understand and Jesus was completely misunderstood. So that link was the patron becoming a Christian and then uh, the changes happen. In fact, like I mean, in your free time, you should read uh, in the letters, the last section. So Paul writes a lot of names, a lot of names thanking like, I thank so-and-so, I thank so-and-so, I thank so-and-so. And sometimes you'll be wondering like, there will be names of emperors too, or the family of some rulers too. So is there a possibility? Maybe there is, because sometimes, I mean, the word spreads so fast. So definitely there's a possibility that he also found some favor among them too. So patronage was a big, big, big thing. So honor and shame, patronage, all of these are very important in, in the social world. Having said all of this, I said like, okay, I also told you that I'm going to tell you at least something about uh, the language, Greek language and Hebrew language predominantly. So instead of telling you this is the alphabet, I've been telling you from alpha to omega. Well, if you're somebody who's really keen in memorizing, I will send you the scanned document. Give it a try. There's nothing wrong. I mean, uh, some of the things, uh, what happens is like, as we are getting older, uh, memorization becomes difficult. But that is also a very good way to beat dementia. So... I will try, I give it a try. I will try to memorize uh, these alphabets. And then, yeah, I mean, you, you, you will see like uh, something uh, very interesting happening. But if you're not somebody, I mean, like who would say like, ah, uh, well, yeah, this is not my cup of tea, but I did surely would like to learn a little bit more about these uh, languages. There is one free tool in the uh, of the Bible on the internet, uh, which when compared to many expensive Bible softwares. This also does the job, but uh, maybe not so at that complicated level, but simple, but, but good one. It's called as a blue letter Bible. So in your free time, type blueletterbible.org. It will take you to a website wherein I mean, you can 
uh, you can really the technical word is parse that means like I mean, you are dissecting uh, some words some uh, uh, structures because i mean unlike the english language the greek language the last alphabet that you see on the word sometimes can mean a male sometimes can mean female sometimes the article comes so many times like i think if i'm not wrong um, the article the the same the can be said in either 12 or 24 times 24 ways of saying only the was when i was memorizing why can't they just have only one the <laughs> so i mean the language can be quite uh, sometimes i mean as a bible college student you don't have an option you just have to memorize but uh, yeah so there, there's something interesting funny uh, hebrew has its own fun one one simple fun is like it doesn't from start from left to right it starts from right to left so uh, there are dots in the alphabet so if there is one single dot missing it means something else with the double dots it means something else so it can be fun it can be uh, also can be a quite challenge but i mean all of this can be avoided but if you are keen you can always learn so blue letter bible is a very good uh, uh, research tool in fact like uh, for one of my courses i mean those who did not have bible software the the professor was encouraging and I mean the professor was quite generous in uh, helping them to use even this tool to um, to just do it for their assignments so it's a very good tool and then if you're somebody who wants to know the Jewish thought like for example we Christians have both Old Testament and New Testament together but then I mean if you go to a synagogue uh, they would be studying mostly the Old Testament. So they definitely are people from a Jewish background uh, might not and will not uh, be focusing so much on Jesus and the writings after that. But there is a good research, uh, good resource called Safaria. Safaria, that also is another website which gives us the commentaries on uh like for example i mean if if john calvin were to interpret a particular verse of a bible what did the same verse or how was this verse given meaning by somebody else from that period from their uh, uh, faith can also be looked in so it, it's a very interesting tool so yeah maybe you should give a try sometime in your free time let me tell you one more thing. Translation. <laughs> Translation has its own uh, story. Every translation is good in some way, but has its own challenges. So if you remember, like uh, in the very beginning, I was saying, if you take the original, I mean, when I say original, I literally don't mean the papyrus and all of that, but the the printed greek bible that is available to us now and try to just translate it word to word okay word to word i mean the greek letter and then you put it below greek letter put it below if you do that it will not make sense so there is an additional help that is needed so this group of scholars who gather together, uh, each each uh, version or like for example, NIV has its own team, NRSV has its own team, ESV has its own. So these people, like uh, that's one of the very reasons why you have the Society of Biblical Literature, um, and then you also have uh, these Bible societies in every country almost now. So which produce these Bibles translated in the local language or in English. So then there is there is definitely uh, what we say 
a reason why they translate a particular way. Like for example, let's let's take our own uh, uh, Presbyterian pastor. Anybody want to give a guess? I mean, who who was also known as good uh, translator, but was very famous. So Eugene Peterson. Okay, Eugene Peterson, he was a Presbyterian minister in America. Uh, once again, we were fortunate that he was in Vancouver, taught in Regent College for a few years. So he translated the Bible uh, into English. <laughs> but then, I mean, you should realize, uh, did he just take a few other English languages uh, material and then he translated it into his version? He did not do that. So his earlier study, like after his Bible college study, he specialized and focused on the Greek and Hebrew. And I mean, he, he's, he was trained in the original languages. And uh, yeah, I mean, he, he was a minister for many, many years before he became a professor. But then, I mean, he was approached by somebody and was asked to uh, put it forward in a simple language. So he will say like, this version is for the contemporary world. The contemporary world. So his famous uh, disciple or famous uh, favorite fan, or somebody who's also a very popular music star, I think it's U2 or somebody. Yeah, so somebody who's very yeah, I mean, he, he, he really liked the version. But then, I mean, this contemporary version, as I said, it was not, I mean, basically you and I can also take, like, for example, King James Version, we can take and then keep changing the D to God and or, I mean, where uh, the D has to be changed to you, the thou has to be changed to God. So we can do that too. But that's not the point. I mean, he, he did not do it that way. He literally assembled a team of people I mean, who are experts in Greek, experts in Hebrew, and experts in Arabic, and then they literally looked into uh, God's word uh, uh, from the original language and then put it into their simple contemporary language. So if you see the message, that's also a version, just like New International Version. So that boasts itself of saying, this is more for the contemporary mind, or I mean, those who literally want it in the simplest possible way. Now, I mean, uh, I did share, I think, with you, like, my personal preference always has been for uh, NIV, New International Version. <laughs> One of the reasons could be, like, when I became a Christian, like, that was the first version that I had, and then I started reading it. I like the language. I uh, I find it very, like, not that I don't like NRSV or ESV, but uh, th this this wording, the way it has been phrased, seems to have become very uh, very comfortable to me. But then, I mean, there are, I've met several friends who who follow NRSV or ESV, called as the English Standard Version. So the the logic behind these translations is. As I said earlier, like, I mean, you're taking the word, the original language, and you're putting the English word. So when you are uh, when you are doing it, the word that is said is dynamic equivalent, dynamic equivalent. That means, like, which is the closest English word that can represent this original language? And then they will phrase it into a sentence. So NIV follows one particular method, which might not be 100% true to the original language, whereas NRSV or ESV will both saying like, we are closer to the text. But then, I mean, it has its own challenges because sometimes it can really confuse us in some things. Uh, like for example, I mean, the, in the Psalms, I mean, there are several times there are some words which, uh, which could have been translated in one way, but this particular translation group chose it to translate it another way. But all with a sincere heart. I mean, basically, they, they want to make sure that like uh, 
God's word is uh, still understood in the best possible way. And of course, it is not a one person's decision. So because it's a group of people, uh, everybody has to agree. And or at least the majority have to agree before they can change some uh, words, right? So yeah, that that's the simplest explanation that I can give about the translation business as such. For example, in my own local language, like called Telugu, uh, I mean, so, so, some of the ways can be, uh, the words are ch changed in a different way. When I translate it into English, or when I keep side by side, I see, oh, does it really mean the same? No, it doesn't. But then whoever has translated, the group of people who have come together, uh, they felt like, okay, this is the best way that we can translate. <laughs> but then, I mean, unfortunately, or fortunately, my original state was divided into two states. So now when this new state was formed, these people felt like, oh, no, 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 the earlier group has really not understood us very well. So we we need to have in our own way. Of course, uh, from the uh, one, one single version in one language, again, I mean, it has also become two or three languages, uh, two or three same language, but two or three different versions. So, I mean, everybody is uh, trying to say like, we are just trying to be as uh, faithful as possible to God's word. So all said and done, that's been the simplest way that I can explain. Uh, there are some very, very, very uh, simplest ways of Bible, like today's English Bible, if you see, it's a, or Good News Bible, that's going to be quite thick, but then very simple, understandable. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, each would have their own uh, understanding. But I, if you ask me, I mean, which one should you go by? I would say go with an IV. <laughs> so why? Uh, not just it is my personal preference, but obviously there are uh, some. Uh, I I would say like it 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 has been put together in such a way to make greater sense and understand it much easier. Yeah. Okay, I have spoken quite a lot. Please tell me if there are any questions, any doubts, anything that you did not understand. Uh, whether it can be from this week, last week, or any weeks that we covered till now. Yeah. So I'll be glad and happy. Yeah. Hey, uh, hi, Krishna. Um, yeah. Wilco, yeah. Um, maybe just a question about the, yeah. the, the Old Testament. Uh -huh. um, so that was written in, in a regional language, maybe Aramaic or, or something else. Hebrew, yeah, yeah or Hebrew, yeah. uh, Hebrew. Um, so our first, so, so eventually I, I believe that was then translated into Greek. Um, yeah, so like for example, what we say is, uh, the, like I mean, if you see the original language, it is Hebrew and a parts of it in Aramaic, like Daniel yeah. and a little bit, but then by Jesus' time, okay, Alexander had already uh, conquered that part of the world and yeah. Greek culture had been promoted quite a lot. The Greek world has been promoted quite a lot. In fact, I mean, that's one of the biggest surprises, right? I mean, like, why would this uh, Hebrew-speaking uh, group of people start writing everything in Greek? Because Greek was the language of the day and then... Uh, uh, starting on, uh, uh, I mean, Alexander the Great, and then I mean, you will see that thought being going on. So there is a, something, a word called Septuagint. Septuagint is basically the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. That means the Old Testament, right? Mm. Now, of course, I mean, like uh, 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 people have debated about certain things in the Septuagint, <laughs> so like, uh, and said like, no, 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 no. We have to go back to the original language, go back yeah. to Hebrew. And then it, it, it was in a good way, uh, a good exercise. But then I mean, uh, 
of course, I mean, we don't have from Hebrew to Greek to English. There is also a big component of uh, the Bible also being written in Latin too, right? So, yeah, I did yeah. not touch anything about that because when we are talking about uh, the versions that are available to us, most of them are uh, have, or most of these committees are studying and studied uh, the Greek language, the Hebrew language. That's one of the reasons why the Bible colleges uh, uh, insist so much on learning the original language, yeah, if possible. Yeah, so so yeah. The, the first century Christians, yeah. um, their reference to the Old Testament, would, yeah. do you yeah. think they would have, um, let's say they were somewhere in, in Asia, would they then have been sort of interpreting it um, based on on the Greek version or or Hebrew or Aramaic? Mostly, mostly the Greek version. Septuagint yeah. was the was the word for for a long, long time. So yeah, I mean, so actually taking it even further, like for example. Even till Luther's time, uh, uh, or the reformer, right? I mean, like now we are the products of Reformation. One of their major complaints has been like, we have not stayed true to the word of God. So when they fought with the Catholic Church, I mean, the word that is used is sola scriptura. That means like, I mean, scripture alone. But then, I mean, like, what is the scripture alone they are talking about? Like, they are talking about uh, the original language scripture and what it meant and uh, how do we understand. So, yeah. So, okay. I mean, like, okay. I, 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 I don't know. Did I understand your question? Correctly? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I was just, it was just sort of um, um, when you were talking about translations and um, I was thinking about lost in translation um i was just thinking of um, maybe yeah. the references that some of the people had at that time when christianity mm -hmm. was was spreading over the world um what what language were they actually sort of reading it in oh, yeah. in fact yeah i mean that, that's a big uh, area but uh, just because you have mentioned it like uh, let me touch a little bit so there have been even some scholars uh, who have written a good number of books saying like, uh, because, they're, they're, because we do not have the original copies, then all of this translation business is a, a waste, right? But then, I mean, like, if we, if we make a, a, a comparative study of, like, let's imagine the available matter, uh, I mean, material of the similar centuries, uh, uh, I mean, just not the Bible, but like any other literature, the possibility of uh, the Bible being true is much higher when compared to many other things. So th that was the very reason why I was trying to insist on saying like, it is not mythology. It is not like fi fiction. It is not like created stories. Because I think like that's one of the major challenges advancement produces. Like uh, the several times people have challenged saying like, uh, no, 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 no. I mean, like uh, you don't understand or uh, there have been so many inconsistencies. But I mean, there have been inconsistencies in many things. Like, for example, uh, one of the major questions that you and I might encounter is like, it is not one person who has written and then we are copying it from them. So there have been several copies of the same thing. And then sometimes they've been put together, sometimes they've been modified. So there is, uh, what you say, a big word called as textual criticism. So like, for example, when the people who are copying that too, they could have made some errors, maybe errors of uh, fatigue or errors of not being able to understand the exact letter or word. So those are some minor errors. Sometimes, I mean, a king might change like, ah, this word doesn't like this. Uh, so I mean, those are also possibilities, but those are very, very rare, very, very minimal. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. 
So the Bible has been attacked in by many ways by many people. Uh, so yeah, I mean it's we, we have to go with an open mind, saying like yeah, it's fine, it's okay. There might be some uh, inconsistencies here and there, but it's uh, it's still okay. Okay, friends, any other questions? I mean, today we are five minutes beyond eight, so anybody, uh, I hope, I mean, I'm not stopping anybody's dinner time. I know Wilco has come late, so I hope he's hungry. <laughs> so, yeah. If there are no other questions, then maybe we'll stop here. Uh, yeah. And... In fact, probably I will stop the, the 